Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. So we started a series last week called On Your Mark, and it's going through the book of Mark in 16 messages through the 16 chapters from last week through Easter. We're going to look at the life of Jesus Christ in the gospel of Mark. Woo! And it's on your mark because Mark goes at a breakneck speed. Um, Mark just kind of goes back to back to back to back to back with, with stories that are a little bit shorter and compact and like right at you, showing the power and authority of who Christ is um, again and again and again and again. So what's going to happen is we're going to go through a chapter a week. Um, last week, I think there was like seven small sermons inside of one message. Um, this week, there's only five, so you're good to go. You can just relax. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to answer a question. Um, as we look at On Your Mark, the life of Jesus in the book of Mark. Why Mark? We said it last week. I'm sure I'll say it throughout the whole series. The book of Mark moves very quickly and focused on the power and authority of Jesus during his earthly ministry. It is a short and intense collage of the life of Jesus. Basically, we've never gone straight through a gospel here at the church. We're almost three years old as a church. We've gone through the book of Colossians. We've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, kind of like slowly marched through. But we've never taken on uh, something this size before. So we thought, hey, if we're going to take on one of the gospels, let's take on the shortest one first. That's for everybody's sake. Um, and so it just happens to work by the grace of God that we can go from the birth of Jesus on uh, Christmas Eve, starting that next week, go from the birth to the death and resurrection in a great time from Christmas to Easter, which seems to work perfect. Um, and so with that said, let me pray and then start this week's message. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you that we're in your presence, that we get to praise your name with your people. And as we get into your word, God, I pray that you would do amazing things in all of us. God, I don't pretend to know how everyone came here today. God, whether we came encouraged already uh, or whether we came broken, um, God, whether we feel like things are going well or things are not going well, God, I just, I thank you that you speak to all situations right now where all of us are at, God, individually and corporately to all of us, God, that you would just speak and that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, Amen. So if you have your Bible, go to Mark chapter 2. Do that now. I'm going to give you just a, a moment to do that because we're going to move quickly, like I said. So um, you're going to want to get there. One of the beauties of going straight through Scripture like this is it, it makes sure that we uh, take in the full counsel of God. And so we're not able to just dodge verses that aren't very comfortable. We have to push through them. And so as we, we do that, some things might um, sometimes confront uh, some beliefs if we've only had certain things taught to us before or only read certain sections of the Bible. And so um, we're going to see today in Mark chapter 2 uh, a lot of controversy surrounding Christ. In fact, controversy that he starts, um, that, that Christ is very controversial, and we're going to see it here in the scriptures that we look at today. So if you're in Mark chapter 2, and if you're taking notes, write down for this first section, here's the, the title, Crowd Carriers crippled man, critics, and Christ. Whew. Yeah, say that fast. Okay, I'll try. Crowd carriers, crippled man, critics, and Christ. Here we go. Verse 1 says this. A few days later, <clears throat> when Jesus again entered Capernaum, I want to just say uh, he's re-entering a place that we found him in Mark chapter 1 last week. Last week in Mark chapter 1, he went out and he called disciples to himself, Andrew and Simon, who is Peter, and James and John, and they go into Capernaum. He goes into the synagogue, and it says he teaches with authority. So last week we looked at the, that he taught with authority, and as he did so, a man that had a, was demon-possessed, the demon starts speaking like, what are you about to do? Are you going to take us out? I know who you are. Jesus cast the demon out, showing that he has authority to teach and also authority to cast out demons. That evening, after the Sabbath was over so people could move as they pleased, everyone shows up at Peter's house because that's where Jesus had gone. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, showing that not only does he have authority to, to teach with authority more than the teachers of the law, to cast out demons, he also has authority to heal. He heals his mother-in-law. 
Everyone comes. This is the whole town gathered at the door. And he heals and casts out demons like crazy. And then in the morning, he goes out to pray. And, and while he's praying, um, the disciples come to him, uh, Peter specifically, and, and they say, like, what are you doing? Everybody's looking for you. And, and Jesus tells him, like, I, I need to preach the word, and that's hindering what I came here to do. I'm about to travel through Galilee and preach the word. And as he went through Galilee, he, he preached the word, and he healed, and he cast out demons. And Jesus is full-blown doing the ministry that Jesus does at, at a, an awesome pace. And the word about him is spreading so fast that it says he can't even really enter into towns because everybody's looking for him. In fact, even when he's not in town, people come out looking for him. And so what we see here is he comes back into Capernaum. He's back. The place where it kind of kicked off with the casting out of a demon and the teaching with authority and the healing people. He's back. Again, he entered Capernaum. The people heard that he had come home. Interesting statement. Um, it's the, the home base. It's the, the kind of the headquarters where Jesus does his ministry in Galilee is in Capernaum. Most believe that it was probably at Peter's house where he was at before is kind of where home is during this time. And so he comes back to the house and they gathered, listen to this, in such large numbers that there was no room left. In, a, in an average house then, uh, maybe 50 people could squeeze inside. And their house is a little more open than, than maybe ours are. We have so many rooms kind of cut into our houses. Not that open concept houses, but oftentimes, like my house, there's walls all over the place. Um, and it's not that big of a house. To get 50 people in my house, we'd all be in different rooms. Like five of you would be in the bathroom. It'd be weird. <laughs> um, and, and so the, the, the house is filled up, and then it even says there's not even room outside the door. Such a large number, there's not room left, not even outside the door. So outside of the house is so packed. And he preached the word to them. You'll see that, that Jesus is first priority in his mission. Yes, he heals. Yes, he casts out demons, but that validates the fact that he's the Messiah and that we, he says carries massive weight because he came to preach the word. And so he's preaching the word to all the people that have gathered and so many people have gathered that you can't even quite get access. This is the crowd. The crowd has come to see Jesus. He's back and everybody wants a piece of him. And so they're all there, and Jesus does what Jesus does, and he preaches the gospel. And as he's preaching the word, what he's preaching is what we found uh, in Mark chapter 1. This is what he was preaching. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So he was describing what that good news is. He's preaching the word. Now check this story out. Maybe you've heard it before. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. So we saw the crowd. We see here four men carrying what I called was the crippled man because I wanted to start with the sea because everything else started with the sea. Um, he's paralyzed and they're, they're carrying him to get to Jesus. The fame of Jesus has already spread. He teaches with authority. He casts out demons. He can heal people. He has that kind of power. And he, he's the Messiah. Some, some of that would have started to get around like, is this the one? And so they, they come believing that the paralyzed man can be healed, and it's interesting because it says, some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Whenever I pictured the story when I was younger, maybe it's the way I read it, um, I only pictured four guys coming with him. It says, men came, four of them carrying the man that was paralyzed. I, I wonder how many there was. Potentially, there's more than just the four, and, and the one that's paralyzed on the, the mat or the, um, the well, a mat, it's kind of hard because of the way we might picture a mat. It's one that you would at least be able to roll up, we'll see later in the story. Um, probably stronger than like what we have is like a yoga mat or something. Um, to carry a full-grown man on it would be difficult. But, so the men come, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. How many of those are good friends? Like, you want to get to Jesus? You don't have the ability to get to him by yourself. Uh, we'll use our strength and energy to get you there. In fact, we're not going to get a good spot at the house because we're busy carrying you instead of hurrying up and showing up there. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, the crowd isn't, I don't think, necessarily bad people. They're um, very curious, but they're very self-involved. If you know that the 
that Jesus can heal someone. And you're able-bodied enough to get a good place in the crowd. And you're so focused on what's going on inside of there for your amazement and just kind of your view that you've stopped access from someone paralyzed getting to the one that all belief can heal. There's a big difference between you and the carriers. The crowd is kind of the, the curious crowd, the, the kind of, it's, it's for me, I'm just going to sit and absorb it, and, and not really use my energy or effort to get out of the way. It's about me. I'm in your way. Too bad. I got here first. Yeah, but this guy's paralyzed. Doesn't matter. I'm interested in where I get to stand in this thing and, and making sure where I'm at. And the crowd, um, they, they tend to be, even though they were, you know, filling the house and outside of the house. Uh, you ever have somebody tell you, um, my dad would have told me this when I was a kid, you stand in front of the TV and they're like, you make a better door than a window? Yeah. Th these people have essentially even, like, no, the doorways open, made a door. They've made it, like, locked. Like, you can't come in. And the person that needs it the most is on the outside. Think through that for a moment because although the Bible tells us who Jesus is, that's the focus of all of this, is who Christ is. In this story, you'll see that too. We can also glean a lot from seeing how people respond to him because we tend to have some similar tendencies to people we see throughout Scripture. The Bible is not, should not be a story of us just trying to find ourselves in it. We find Christ in it and he tells us who we are. But as we see who Christ is, we oftentimes, he pulls out things about who we are as we see how people have responded to him. So, the thought I just had there as far as the carriers versus the crowd is bringers versus blockers. Bringers versus blockers. And we'll tend to have that mentality even now today inside of the church world where we get so excited for what we get out of church that we forget that other people need it maybe even more than we do because now we've experienced some of that. So we get the goodness of God, we understand some of the beauty of who he is, and, and it's really easy, it's really easy to worry about our comforts inside of the church instead of being carriers for people that need him desperately. Huh. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, these are some loyal friends, check this out. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. Now, most of the homes then uh, in that area would have had stairs or a ladder, a way to get to the roof because the roof was actually used for um, a place to eat, oftentimes entertaining. Uh, you, you would go up there and it was a, a place that you could dwell and it was kind of part of your house. It'd be like how we have a deck on our houses now sometimes. It'd be similar to that, but on top of the roof. So some houses now that's kind of come back and in some areas that happens, not normally in Washington because it rains so much. That's not fun. Oh, you want to go up on the roof today? <laughs> That's what you do to people you don't like, okay? Uh, meet you up there. Uh, so, so what they do is they would have had access, but how many know regardless of the access you have, it's not easy to carry someone up even stairs, especially a ladder, to get to the top of the roof. So they go up on top of the roof, and now you need to understand how the roof was normally made with um, cross beams for structural purposes, and then uh, with those cross beams would have been uh, like smaller sticks, to kind of bring that together um, with mud and thatch put together. And then the, the heat of the sun would dry that mud to make it hard. So you could walk on it. You could put a table and chairs up there. Um, it was strong enough to be like a floor. And then in Luke, we see that they say he had to remove some tiles. And so there's some sort of tiles on there. I don't know if it was just more mud dried in the sun and put on top of those. Um, but this is an effort. If it's something that you can stand on and be on and you're not worried about crushing your family underneath, it's fairly strong. And so it's not like you just kind of came to this little shack and you're able to just kind of like pull back a little couple little pieces and, and send your body in. They, they had to tear the roof off. Huh? Like that. <laughs> so they tear the roof off. They made an opening in the roof. And it doesn't say if they had tools or whatever. They would have had to use something, I'm sure, because you don't just, that would have taken a long time. And, yeah, worked you down to the bone there. Um, opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. Uh, here's another interesting thing is you're kind of picturing the story with this huge crowd kind of pressing in on Jesus and he's declaring the gospel. And th there's a group of people on the roof forcing their way, way in by breaking a hole in the roof. Large enough for a grown man to be lowered into. I've, <laughs> I've been distracted while trying to preach before. 
sometimes I get, distra- I get distracted pretty easy in general. Um, and so sometimes here, something happens, uh, whatever, uh, inside the service, and I'll have to like purposefully not get distracted. Like, Russ, focus. I cannot imagine that we're standing here and, and I'm preaching, and how long does it take to rip through the roof? And so it, when you're digging through something from the top and there's an open place underneath, Things fall. So it'd be sitting there preaching and parts of the roof, it's sticks, it's mud, it's thatch that is dried out. It's pieces and particles trying trying to be a serious conversation about like, this is the word. You're all here and I'm gonna give it to you now. How distract, and for how long is that a distraction? I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't say. We can just kind of think through what that would take. Um, and, and the fact that Jesus, I think right there, just showed massive amounts of patience. Massive amounts of patience. So he, he's preaching the word. These four guys, I love it. It's beautiful. Listen, we told you we're going to get you to Jesus. The crowd's in the way, and they're not moving for us. Take it into our own hands. They're good for it. Like, we're going to get you there, regardless if we have to tear the roof off. I just like saying that. And then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So they lower him down in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the men that would fight through a roof, that would want to push through a crowd that was impossible to get through, but they would climb up onto the top and push through and and fight through this roof and, and lower this man on his mat in front of Jesus. He sees their faith. These guys believe so big that they just tore a hole in someone else's roof of their house. It wasn't their house. They showed up at someone's home. Could you imagine? Like you have this gathering. Jesus comes over. All your friends, family, the neighborhood shows up. And then all of a sudden, you, your house. You just start seeing, like, you hear shingles getting ripped off the top. Drywall starts falling. Wouldn't you be kind of angry? Okay. You wouldn't, so you guys are awesome. So, so he gets lower down. It says, uh, he, when he saw their faith, it was a seeable faith. How many know big faith that really believes and that, that turns to Jesus and that kind of, it's a seeable faith? James says, faith without works is dead. Uh, why? Because faith that really is um, putting full belief into Jesus uh, is a faith that transforms. It's a faith that that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in you when that happens. And and there's a change that happens. Now, we don't look at people and say like, oh, this is how much faith they have. Look how great they are. But Jesus can identify instantly that's faith. Now, maybe you have seen it before, though. Maybe you've been around people that have gone through things. Maybe you've gone through things where your faith is seeable. But Jesus right here sees their faith. Now, listen to this. He said to the paralyzed man, it says their faith, it doesn't qualify who there is, but based on the statement Jesus is about to make, it would have been the, the men bringing him down through the hole and the paralyzed man's faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Just so you know, um, that's Jesus just saying like, bang, shots fired. Because not only was it a big deal to heal somebody that's paralyzed, Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. He goes to a deeper level. Uh, A couple weeks back when we were finishing the series Hallelujah, talking about what it looks to praise God, Jesus saw the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, um, and, and he goes to a deeper level. She wants to deal with something over here. He goes and digs at a deeper level. The same thing happens here. A man gets dropped in. He has faith that Jesus can heal him of his uh, physical issues. And Jesus says, I'm going to deal with the bigger issue of the two. I'm going to speak to the bigger issue. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there. This is the next group. They're the critics. So if you can't, if it's standing room only and you can't fit and you can't even get a paralyzed guy in, 
Have you ever been at, um, at some sort of event where there's so many people and the person maybe speaking or the band playing are in the front and not everybody can see? So they're like down in the front and the only people that sit down are the ones in the front because they can still see even if they sit down. Everybody else has to stand. If you're sitting at a place where it's like this kind of packed, um, you're close. You're a front row critic. You're sitting there as a critic. I wanted to see some of the people in this story because I think it's good for us to kind of view, like, God, where am I sitting? And I don't mean like, hey, if you're in the front row. That's not what I mean. But, but what is my hope and what is my heart at coming to Christ or coming to environments where Christ is the focus? Am I the crowd? Do I, do I come and it's not really um, kind, of, kind of, I don't care what anybody else needs? I'll keep my back to everybody, even the paralyzed man that's trying to get to him, because this is about me just kind of absorbing right now. And I'm probably well-bodied. I'm just curious and want to just hang out in what this has to be, or what I want it to be, or what this is. But kind of the next person that's, that, that fights out there to bring people... Did I just die? I felt like I did up here. Uh, to bring people to the atmosphere, the environment where Jesus is the focus? Do I understand that I am the crippled man? That all of us at some point are the crippled man? They need Jesus and we usually come to him out of broken situations in our life and he speaks to the deeper issues. Most of us have come to Christ because of things we got ourselves into or that the broken and flawed world got, got to us. And so we finally break down and because of the external things, we come to him and we're like, help with this thing. And he goes like, let me talk something a lot deeper than what you came to me for. You came to me because you wanted this fixed, but let me, let me go to the heart of what's really, let me go to your heart and what's really going on here. Like, we'll talk about all this stuff, but let's talk about the real issue. Son, your sins are forgiven. Let me just, if this just got taken care of without this, then we might feel a little bit better, but the real problem isn't fixed, and we'll be back again with the same stuff. But when he speaks to this, even if this doesn't change, I'm good. If I go back forgiven and I'm still paralyzed, actually, I'm still way better off than if I went back paralyzed and unforgiven. Or unparalyzed, and, from well bodied and unforgiven. And so, what we see is the, the crowd, the carriers, the crippled man, and here we see the critics. Can I be honest? Because I preach, and the, one of my um, things I believe God's called me to do is to be a, a teacher of His Word, I, I tend to like analyze people that preach and teach sometimes way too harshly. And so, instead of having a focus of like, Hey, who should I be bringing to something like this so they could receive what God has to say through one of his people? Um, I want to like sit in the front row and first like listen a bunch of times and see if it's okay first. Well, you know what? I don't think that's all right. And, and, and kind of like analyze and, and, and nitpick. And at the same time, I don't want people to do that to me. I'm a hypocrite. I try not to be and I'm confessing right now. There's healing and confession and prayer. So um, pray for me. So, so what these guys do is they, they show up as the, the teachers of the law and, and they get front row seats so they can hear what Jesus has to say. Not because they're hoping to see the beauty of a man come through a roof and be healed and forgiven, but because they want to see like, is it okay what he's doing? Oftentimes, um, critics... Uh, aren't interested in really helping. They're not. Um, can oftentimes bring more division than unity. Unfortunately, we live in a, a culture where that's like the norm. Now everyone's a critic of everything. And, um, and everyone has a voice now, even without an education. So you might not know what you're talking about, but by golly, let me tell you about it. And, and what we see is these guys actually knew what they were talking about um, from the standpoint of they were teachers of the law, but they came to, to critique, not to experience or care about what Christ really was saying. Listen to this, it's beautiful. 
Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they're right. No one can forgive sins but God alone. In fact, most of the other miracles you see Jesus do, he empowered his people to do later. Through the Holy Spirit, you see the, the church uh, in the beginning of Acts. They go out and they, they cast out demons. They heal people. Like you see the Holy Spirit work. You see uh, through his people. But the one thing they can't ever really do is they can't say you're forgiven of sins and really forgive someone of their sins. Only God can forgive someone of their sins. So they're right in saying that, but they're wrong in understanding who is that's saying that. Hmm. And if anyone else did say it, it would be blasphemy. Listen, immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. <laughs> That's awesome. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk? The answer is, first of all, neither of those are easy. Have you done either of those? I don't know anybody that's done either of those ever, other than Jesus. I've never run anybody that's been, had the power to forgive someone of sins. I've also never met anyone who's walked up to a paralyzed person and, and just said, like, pick up your mat and go. And they just did it. Huh. They're both difficult. But from a standpoint of the viewers, it'd be easier to say with your mouth your sins are forgiven because it's hard to tell if that really happened. But if you say, like, hey, you're healed, get up and walk out, Pretty obvious. Right this second. If the guy tries to move and can't, eh. Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. But listen, this is awesome. This is where we see Christ. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. <laughs> The Son of Man is an interesting title. It's actually the title that Jesus prefers when he gives himself a title in Scripture. The Son of Man would have meant kind of, kind of two things. Um, one would have spoken to the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man, spoken to the humanity of who he is, but primarily it's a, 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 it's a title for the Messiah found way back in the Old Ta Testament in Daniel chapter 7. Listen to, listen to this. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. In my vision at night, I looked. This is Daniel. And there before me was one like a son of man. Now, obviously, this isn't a normal man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days, the father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. That's not a normal person. That's not a regular prophet. That's Jesus. Sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. The only one that can be worshipped is God himself. He says, if anyone else is worshipped, that's an idol, and you shall have no other idols. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Jesus, right that, there when he declares that, first he already got him riled up and shots are fired and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now he looks at everybody and says, I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He's saying, me, I just made that statement. I'm the son of man. You guys are the teachers of the law. You've read Daniel 7. You know what I'm talking about when I say I'm the son of man right here, right now. I'm the one that has sovereign power to declare this man's sins forgiven. And watch this. Just to show you, he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. I love the authority of that. He doesn't like slowly walking through a process or get everybody prepared. I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. That's cool to me. Forced to come in through the roof from friends that would rip through, carry him, bring him down in front of Jesus. Uh, his, their faith is seeable. Jesus heals him, forgives him of his sins, had to come in through the roof or walk out the door that he couldn't get in. And everybody now that wouldn't get out of the way so that he could get to Jesus is getting out of his way like. That happened. It says, this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. The reason we're going through the book of Mark is because often we just need regular reminders of the authority and power that, that, of who Jesus Christ is. 
that he's the Messiah. He's fully God and fully man. He, he's not, um, as some say, just a great teacher or some would say maybe a prophet. He is the Messiah. He is God in flesh. Huh. I need to go faster through this. It's the new year. We're going to a new gear. Here we go. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him. This is pretty cool. He goes out beside the lake. Why? Because more people can meet outside by the lake than they can inside of a house. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them as he walked along. So he's not just sitting in one place teaching. That's kind of interesting. That'd be like, hey, you guys come here on Sunday. And I go, all right, everybody get up. Follow me or I'm going to teach you something. And we just go for a walk. And I'm just telling you stuff as we go. Except for way cooler than that because it's Jesus, not me. So once again, Jesus went outside beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them, listen. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Levi is Matthew. We know that from the book of Matthew. We know that from the book of Luke. We also know that from the book of Mark a little bit later on when they describe who the uh, disciples are. Levi is Mark, same guy, kind of like Simon is Peter. So Levi is sitting at a tax collector's booth. I need to, uh, just for a minute, tell you what that looked like. A tax collector in this area um, of Israel where the people there are Jewish. A tax collector, what they had done is there's, they're under Roman rule in that area. And so the Romans wanted a tax. And the way that they did that is they would have someone in the city um, put it in a bid to be the tax, tax collector for that area. So what you had to do is say, I will give Rome this much or the local leader, and then they would take care of Rome, this much, here's how much I'll give you for the rights to be able to tax my own people. And the way that you got paid is, uh, Rome would set a, a percentage or a rate, um, a number that you had to hit. Okay, you hit this number, and anything above that is what you get paid. So what you would do is, to make money, is you would not only tax your own people, at a normal rate to pay the people above you, but you would make that um, much larger and extort your own people so that you could be rich. And so a tax collector's job was very um, beneficial for them financially. It was horrific for them as far as the community goes. Because what they did is against their own people to their brothers and sisters and relatives and family that they would steal from you without you having the ability to do anything about it. It's like, it's taxes. <laughs> They're going to get theirs. And the lower level taxmen were the strong arms to make sure they got theirs. And so Levi probably isn't the best guy out there. He's turned his back on his people so that he could be rich. And he's the enforcer to make sure that the, the people that rule them get paid. So I'm here on behalf of the people that you hate as one of you to not only pay them, but so I can get rich taking from you. They were hated in the community. They were seen as unclean. They were kicked out of, they couldn't even go into the synagogues. In fact, you couldn't hate, if, you're, if somebody in your family became a tax collector, put in a bid, everyone hated them and told you that you can't hang out with them anymore or you're unclean. So you were excommunicated from the people because you decided you wanted to make a fast buck. And it was very lucrative. And you were very hated. And so, Jesus, because he likes to ruffle feathers apparently, as he walked along, he saw a Levi, who was Matthew, sitting at the tax collector's booth. You were seen as a traitor, unclean, excommunicated, corrupt. And you took advantage of your own fellow Jews. And he says to him, follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Levi got up and followed him. We know that he left everything to follow him. In fact, when you leave a, a business like being a tax collector, there's somebody that comes in on that role right away because it's very lucrative. Now, fishing was a big thing. He already told fishermen to come follow him. And that was a great business in that area because of um, just the, the trade and, and it was a thriving community of fishermen. And so Levi is known as the tax collector that everybody hates because he takes their money so that he can get rich, so that they can stay poor, so that the government above them has more resources to kind of keep them under their thumb. And, and so he's hated. And Jesus walks up to that guy and says, follow me. And he leaves it knowing that once you leave that, there's no coming back. As a fisherman, you can go back onto a boat again. 
As a tax collector, you move on, somebody's taking your place, and they're not giving it back. Hmm. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, this is an awesome call, first off. I just want to tell you that uh, I'm going to start asking people to be on our leadership team this way. Hey, why don't you come, follow me, I'll be over for dinner tonight, you're cooking. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> that's rad. Um, so while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, listen, many tax collectors, they're hated by their own, and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. The sinners were the ones that uh, people identified as not trying to follow after God's law. Like they, they, weren't, they were either rebelling purposefully against it or, or away from it. Um, that doesn't mean that they, they were people that sometimes messed up. They were people that decided that they were done with it. Does that make sense? So once we give our life to Christ, yes, we're still sinners in the fact that we sin, but we're saints from the standpoint of like we're his family, we're his sons and daughters, we're brothers and sisters of the Most High God, made pure, clean, and righteous because of the death that Jesus took for all of our sins. So you're not a sinner by that standpoint anymore because the judgment was already taken on Christ for you, but yes, you still sin, so you're a sinner. That's not what they're talking about. These people are ones that have like rebelled against the ways of the, the religious at that point, and they're just seen as sinners. Now they've turned from that. So the tax collectors, the most hated sinners, and sinners are here. And when it says having dinner, um, literally it means reclining together. And it was interesting that the way they did that, their feet would be away from the table and their heads kind of towards the table. And they put their elbow down. It was a big feast thing where they all hung out. And reclining at the table with somebody and having food with them uh, was a big deal because that means you really associated with them. Not just in passing or, or seeing them somewhere, but that means you were like, associated with them. And so Jesus calls a tax collector, goes to his house, and doesn't just hang out with that tax collector. He hangs out with a bunch of them, with the tax collectors and with sinners. And I love that it says, because there's many of them that followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, and Pharisees are an interesting breed. They're, they're the separated ones. That's literally what that means. They've decided that to be holy, uh, the Bible says is, is to be set apart. They took that a little too far and, and they've decided that the only way to actually be holy is to keep distance from anything and everything. And so they made all of these rules and regulations and religion to kind of define what it meant to be set apart for God. And so they couldn't associate with all kinds of people. They couldn't do a lot of different things because they had to keep their space to show how holy they were. And so when they see Jesus here, when the teachers of the law where Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because they saw it as completely wrong and unclean. We saw in the last chapter that Jesus touched a leper, which was completely against the rules. But Jesus wasn't worried about becoming unclean because of the unclean. He came to them on purpose to make them clean. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is, listen, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And in Luke 5, 32, it finishes that with, but sinners to repentance. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. The problem with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law is they didn't realize they were sick. We looked at it at a very practical level, like how we go to the doctor now. The earlier you know you're sick, the better off they can treat you. You know that to be true, right? So especially with like devastating, debilitating things, um, like cancers or something like that, they'll always say like, man, if we could catch it soon, catch it right away. Like let's deal with it early. And so oftentimes what happens is, um, especially men, I don't know if women do this too, we just like don't want to think about the fact that we could be something wrong with us. And so... Um, a, we oftentimes don't go to regular checkups like we should. And then B, even if something hurts and shows us that it's wrong, we're like, we'll be fine. <laughs> but oftentimes it gets us in trouble later on. And so what happens is we only go to the doctor if like a limb is falling off or a lung is coming up. Like, like oftentimes that, that, that happens, but it would have been most beneficial for us to regularly get um, seen so that there could be course corrections if needed to be in small ways to fix it so there wasn't a big problem. 
How many know that's a lot like our walk with God? Oftentimes what happens is we wait till the wheels fall off. And then we're like, God, help. We realize that we're sick. And so we turn to him and he's like, I've been here the whole time. Why have you been dodging me? Because what happens is if we did our regular checkups with God, if we regularly were like, hey, God, I'm just here to see how I'm doing. Let me look in the Word and kind of see what this says. Let me pray. Let me be in His presence. Let me be with His people. Let's pastor each other. Let's get those regular checkups to see, like, how are things going. We probably wouldn't have to get to the places where the wheels fall off. But instead, we wait till the wheels fall off, and then we cry out to God. And in that moment, don't you see God? So oftentimes, people will say, like, I saw Him most in my broken moments. That's because it's the only time we really turn to Him. And so He says, I... I the he- not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And the Pharisees were just blind to the fact that they were sick. No, I'm not sick. I'm fine. We don't need this. Hmm. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. Um, I think, honestly, that even now people would have a problem with Jesus for this. Be- because it's really easy for us to get into those holy huddle ideas um, it's really easy to preach a message that says, like, and stay away from evil so everybody just hang out together. Um, it, it's easy to say that, but it's not true. Um, there is truth in us pastoring each other. There is truth in us strengthening each other. There is truth to us coming together and worshiping together and sit under the word together. That stuff should happen. But when we go from here, we're called to be a light in the darkness. And we're called to go around and be around people that would be seen as unclean or the, the un righteous so that we can tell them and show them who Jesus is. So Jesus did. Hmm. Let me just clarify. Some people use that statement uh, to sign off on the fact that they haven't decided to live for Jesus and so they still want to live in the areas that they've been before. There's a difference between like going to the darkness and continuing to be dark in the darkness Um, and bringing Jesus to that, knowing that you cannot touch the light in me because it's the Holy Spirit, and so I'm bringing light to darkness, and and darkness cannot reign over light. So the goal is I'm going here to rub off on and not to be rubbed off on. That's the reason we don't do it. We're afraid, right? Right. (sighs) Got to keep moving. So we see Jesus... um, heals the paralyzed man that walks out and declares that he can forgive sins, which is like, he says he's God. And then here we see grace that, that the, the Pharisees don't understand. Like, what do you mean? We've been doing all of these things, and then you're eating at his house? Why aren't you eating at my house? You're eating with the, the tax collectors and the sinners, and what's he doing? And it goes on, and if you're taking notes, write fasting and feasting. Now, John's disciples, that's uh, John the Baptist and the people that were coming out to him at the river um, to repent for their sins and be baptized, uh, and the Pharisees were fasting. The Pharisees would regularly fast. The Pharisees would do lots of different things to show everybody externally how holy they were. Jesus goes after them often, saying, like, you're a whitewashed tomb. You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're wicked and you stink like dead men. And, and so he'd go after the fact that what they did, they did for the external so that people would think they're holy, so they would show a holiness instead of being holy, which will show. And, and so the Pharisees, twice a week, they had decided we're going to fast twice a week. On Mondays and Thursdays, they fasted. And in Scripture, Jesus speaks about those fasts. He says, when you fast, don't be like the Pharisees who go around looking all horrible so that you'll see that they're fasting. They haven't been eating like poor us. Can you believe how holy we are? Man, it's rough being this holy. Jesus goes after that. Jesus, and also back in Isaiah, God speaks to what it looks like to have a fast that honors God. That we get ready, we get prepared. And, and, and in that day, fasting often all through Scripture is associated with mourning and praying. It's crying out to God for something. And so Mondays and Thursdays, they had this time where they were like, uh, deprive self and show everybody how deprived they were and cry out to God. It was a show. They put on a show. And some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Like, hey, isn't that how you be holy? Is show everybody that you fast. Now listen to this. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? 
They knew that in the culture at that time, when it was a wedding festival, um, when you came to a wedding, the, the guest of the bridegroom means like potentially like his best man and, and his groomsmen, like his guys, his friends come to this wedding. Well, it's not like now where you have maybe a 15 to 30 minute uh, kind of wedding and maybe a couple hour reception, everybody hangs out and then goes home. It was like a week long feast where everybody comes together and it's this great time, this celebration. Things were slower then. It wasn't like, I'd love to come to your wedding. I can be there for 12 minutes. Uh, I got a busy schedule. I got things to do, right? Like it was like, okay, yes, there's this wedding. It's my friend. Like we're going to come and for a week. We're going to feast and celebrate. It's this good time. And, and they even had rules that they had written in that, that said like, okay, you don't fast during those times because fasting is a time for mourning and praying. This is a time for celebration, for feasting because we're excited about what's happening. We're here with the groom. And so we're not here to be, be down on him. We're excited for what's going on for him. So what Jesus says is, this is party time. How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while it's feast time? They cannot so long as they have him with them. He says, my guys aren't, I'm only here for a brief amount of time. I'm only here for this short period and it's a time of feasting and celebration. It's a time of spending time together to celebrate the fact that the Messiah has come. It's not a time to cry out for the Messiah. I'm standing right here. They cannot so long as they have him with them, but the time will come when the bridegroom, he's talking about himself, will be taken from them. And on that day they will fast. He's, he's listen, he foreshadows early on right here the fact that he will be crucified, that he will die, and that he will leave them, and they will be broken about it, and they will not eat, and they will pray, and they will mourn the loss of their leader. But right now, why do that? I'm right here. So if you ever wondered kind of what's going on there that's what's happening the fasting versus feasting um but he says that there will be a day where they fast still with me verse 21 we're going to go into um if you're taking notes right religion can't handle the scandal of grace religion can't handle the scandal of grace The gospel is confrontational and a bit offensive, a lot offensive, regardless if you come from a religious background or a reckless background. Because either way, what it says is, you can't do it. Like it looks at, regardless of where you're at, religious or reckless, it looks at you right in the face and says, yeah, you can't. You can't be good with God. Not unless Jesus Christ does something for your righteousness. Whether you're from far or from near, you can't be saved by anything you can do. It's all about Jesus. And that's hard to hear if you've been doing the right things. It's hard to look at somebody that's lived reckless and think, I get the same access as that guy. He's lived reckless. I've been doing all the right things and they've been reckless. That's not fair. It's not fair. It's grace. It's undeserved favor. You don't want fair. You don't want fair. A just God is the reason that Jesus Christ had to accept the wrath of our sins on the cross for us so that God would be just. God is just. You cry out for his mercy, not his justice. <laughs> you know, uh. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth or, cloth or, or new cloth on an old garment. Let's just be real. Nowadays, no one sews. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, a couple people sew. Don't be offended, okay? The majority don't sew. We get a hole in something, we replace. We're consumers. We actually purposely put holes in things, I think, just so we can replace stuff. Like, ah, oh, babe, I got to Look it, it's almost got a hole. I'm going to need to replace that with three new things. No one says those a patch. I do that with white shoes. They don't even have to have a hole. They just get dirty. They get scuffed. My wife's like, have you even cleaned them? I'm like, ah, I don't think it'll help. <laughs> I, think, I think these ones are done. Um, and then before a couple of kids, I would just go get a new pair. Now it's like I get out a toothbrush and some soap. Just buck up. It's what it is. No one sews a patch of 
unshrunk or new cloth in an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse, right? So if you had a hole you wanted to patch and you put a new piece on it and the old piece is already pre-shrunk, it's been washed and dried, it's, it's been used, it's been worn, and you put the new piece on and you sew it to dimension and then that piece gets washed and dried, it shrinks and it tears and it makes that hole that was already there even bigger than it was before. You don't put the new on the old because it cannot accept it. And no one pours new wine into old wineskin. That's because new wine expands. And old wineskin would already have expanded to the extent of its expanding. So if you filled it all the way to the top and then it expands, it breaks or it cracks. And what you thought was good is now spilt everywhere and worthless again. It it broke everything. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskin. Jesus there specifically is talking about the religion of the day and that all the rabbis had come up with all of these regulations and rules to make it so that it was hard for people to, they they burdened the people with rules to get to God. And Jesus comes and says, like, I'm the way to get to God. That's hard to hear if you're one that's been trying to follow the rules that, that firm. Now, if you haven't been good at doing it, it's good to hear. If you've been like having a really hard time following all the laws and regulations that tradition and religion has put into place, it's like a relief to hear like, oh, good, because I suck at that. But if you've been feeling like you're pretty good at it and you've got some sort of um, title because of it or you've got some sort of rule because of it and people look up to you because of how well you're following the rules, then you don't want to let go of that. You like the system of rule following because it does something for you. That's where you get your identity from. And anybody that thinks that they can have access to that kind of holiness without having to walk through those rules, you get mad at and you try to get back under your rule system instead of having them understand grace. Now listen to me. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. It's not about not wanting to honor God, but these people have gone outside of the laws of God and added their own rules and regulations to try to define those laws which were hard for people to follow. It wasn't about a heart after God. When you love somebody, you want to please them. And so the things aren't regulations and rules. They're opportunities to show love. God, I love you. And these things, I know that that you put these in place because you want the best for me. You love me and you want me to honor you correctly. And I know that when I honor you and glorify you correctly, it's of most benefit and joy for me. And so I'm going to do these things because I I love you. And I just long to to show you that. And, And you've put in your your word, how to do so. So I'm going to do that. It's not like, hey, everybody, you're not Christian enough if you don't do these things. Can I tell you, I was a youth pastor before. It's it's really tempting in youth ministry to want to do that because you're so concerned at the outcome of kids' lives. And so you see them start to be reckless and you just want to say like, well, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Stay way away from that and stay away from everybody and get in this, this box over here and just stay there away from everybody. Instead of really teaching them a genuine love for God, you fight against that tension. As a parent, you fight against that tension. I'm going to keep them holy by just keeping them away from everything. Eventually, their innocence is going to be bursted by the world, and you want them to have something deeper than just some rules and regulations. They need a righteousness and a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's easy to get emotionally tied to old ways and miss out on the new. As a church, please, 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 as the people that are the Roots Community Church, that's us, um, never get married to a method. Like we stand firm and we will fight for the truth of the gospel. And and we will do our four pillars and, and, and reach all lost, disciple all found, equip all disciples and send all equipped. And we're trying to get better at that all the time. And we mess up sometimes. And sometimes we do good at some of them. And, and we're working through that. And, and that, we, we long to do that to most glorify God. The way we do each one of those things is probably going to change over the next 40 years. And if you get married to a method like, oh, I really like the way we used to reach lost people that way and we shift because culture shifts or something changes and it's about the method instead of the mission, then, then you can get kind of torn up. So go ahead and get, a, get on board all in on the mission. And while we're on a method, let's do it fully and let's wear that thing out. But if the method changes, the mission doesn't. And don't get married to the method where you, we get all 
issues with each other because the method changed. Oh, man, you hear these crazy stories about churches that have problems because, like, oh, we got, the pastor got a new podium or the, the, they played a different song that I don't really like or the, the, the seat color changed or, or they moved with the place I like to sit. and it, Like, all of these things. Stop it! You're not that those people, but that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. I don't think that's who we are. Um, but make sure we don't ever get there because we're going to do things that you fall in love with that we're going to get rid of. Mm. And then lastly, chapter 2 closes with this. One Sabbath. If you're taking notes, right? The gift of rest. I'm blessed by rest. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples walked along. Uh, they began to pick some heads of grain. They're just walking through the fields and and they, they grabbed some grain, which um, they needed a snack, basically. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Let me just tell you something. The law of the Sabbath, as God declared it, was to seize working, to honor and worship God. Seize working. What had happened is the the rulers and teachers of the day wanted to define what working is so bad that they made these regulations that were ridiculous. Ridiculous. Like you couldn't untie a knot on the Sabbath. You couldn't walk more than 1,999 steps on the Sabbath because 2,000, that's work. You couldn't carry more than a certain amount of anything anywhere. And sometimes it was ridiculous. It was like a teaspoon of something you couldn't carry because that was kind of hard to carry. You couldn't, um, you couldn't do what they were doing by their rules because they were, they were uh, picking the heads of grain and that was reaping a harvest, they said. That was associated with a job. That wasn't a job, that was a snack. They weren't going to the fields to go, like, with all their stuff, like, hey guys, get to work. You know what I mean? Like, reaping the field. They literally like, doop, doop, doop. That's not work. And they had twisted what the Sabbath was. That God had ordained a Sabbath. But it wasn't for the burdens that were added with the rules. It was to be a blessing of rest and worship. That God in six days created everything and on the seventh rested and set that part a day, blessed that day, set it apart as holy as a time that we would rest from work like God did, and honor him with it. You know, in our culture, it's a work, 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 work kind of thing. People usually fall on one side or the other. They either are like workaholics or like lazy bumps. You'll probably tend towards one. And you'll have to fight it on either side. So if you just have a tendency to be lazy, you just have to like tell yourself constantly like, no, work is good, work. And if you're a workaholic, you have to say, no, God ordained rest. And bless that day, called the holy, that I would rest and, and regroup and um, uh, have recreation and, and kind of regather and, and worship him. Huh. He answered, have you never read what David did? This is awesome. Jesus, to the, the, the teachers of the law, looks right at him in the face. And he, I just, sometimes he just digs them. Like, oh, you're the teachers of the law? Have you never read? How many of the last person you want to, like, the person that would get most offended about that is the person that has read the most. And so, like, you go to a professor at a prestigious college, and you're like, haven't you ever read in something that is their subject? That's like, ah! And not only that, but he goes to David, the one that they were hoping that, that the king would show up, like, in the line of David, in a kingly way, that, that they would have rule and reign over this, with this king that, that comes with, like, a sword to... But Jesus comes humble and, and, and says to him, Didn't you, have you ever read about David? What he did? And he's referencing 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. He says, when he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of Abiathar and the, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. I can't get into all of how that works. And he also gave some of, to his companions. Then he said to them, telling you this is Jesus Christ was controversial then he said to them the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath 
They put all these rules and regulations saying, you're, you have to do all this because you're supposed to do this on the Sabbath for the Sabbath. And he says, no, the Sabbath was created for man to give them rest, to get them back into a place of alignment. That if you worship during that day of rest, what you do is whew, regroup. You come back together. You need that. It's good for you to have a time where you with your family and you worship God and, and you get ready to get back to work again. It's not wrong to work, but it's all, it is wrong to not rest. Hmm. Sabbath was made for man. It was a gift of rest for men and women. It was, a work, it was a gift of rest for workers. It was a gift of rest for the field, that the dirt could have rest. It was a gift of rest for the animals if you worked in fields. You need days off to recuperate. You need rest days in everything you do. Think about that. We know that for some areas. If you work out all the time, you know you need rest days. If you, if you go to school all the time, you know you need to just take a day and turn your brain off from all of the school that you need to do. You need it from everything. In fact, it's best served to worship God in that time, and you can worship God in that time in, in, in ways that you regroup and regather and recalibrate and, and recreate. You can have fun together, and it glorifies God. And they had turned it from a blessing to a burden. It was a day of rest and worship, not rules. So the Son of Man, listen to this, this is how he closes this chapter. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. More shots. He says like, oh, you have all these rules of the Sabbath? Oh man, you got all these rules that are underneath the Sabbath because the Sabbath is holy, so you made all these rules to keep it holy and you want men to follow underneath rules. So it goes like, man, rules, Sabbath. Um, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. You're talking to me like I'm this guy. I'm this guy. And, and in doing so, he says, the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Um, in, in John 1 Verse 3, it says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Talking about Jesus, that Jesus is God. That Jesus is part of the triune um, God. And, and that he was a part of creation, an active agent in creation. Then when it says God rested, Jesus is God. And, and he's there and that happened. And so when he says I'm the Lord even of the Sabbath, it's because he's part of what made the Sabbath holy. In Genesis 2, 2 and 3, it says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had done or had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. One of the things that's awesome about rest and forcing yourself to rest, even when you don't feel like you have time to rest, is one of the things that it does is it shows again that you put trust in God. God, I'm doing what you say to do to honor you knowing that it's best to honor you and it's blessed to honor you. And I was, if I'm working seven days a week and grinding in that way um, without any time for rest, then I'm saying in my own strength, I can believe I can make this happen. Um, when I take a day off, what I'm saying is, God, you have this and you're my provider and it's not just in my own strength. Jesus still is bringing rest. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, he says this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Mark chapter 2. I'm excited for this series. I hope it's beneficial for you. I know I'm just basically doing like story time and reading through it and hopefully bringing the story alive and helping you. It, the, the Bible is alive and active, but hopefully you can picture it differently, maybe have some more context to it and be inspired by Jesus Christ and what he did through the, that we see in the Gospels, the story of Jesus Christ. And so when you came in, they said earlier you got a uh, connection card. On the back, this is my next step today. As we worship here in a moment, I pray that you would consider what maybe God is drawing you to today making a first-time decision to give my life to Jesus. He's the only way to have a relationship with, with, with the Father, that, that God is drawing us to himself, and the way that we have a relationship with God is through the works of Jesus Christ, not through anything you can do. We said it, it, Jesus said it, a bunch of times through the chapter we looked at today. It's not through what you can do, it's through grace. That's why it's a scandal. It's why it's hard to swallow when the person next to you has been way more reckless than you and they get the same thing through Jesus Christ. They get saved. That's good news. And if it doesn't sit well with you, it's because you think too highly of yourself and you're self-righteous, so swallow that. 
you need it next to, as much as the next guy and the next guy needs it as much as you. The grace of God through Jesus Christ and the work that he did for our righteousness to stand in right standing with the Most High God. I hope that you would prayerfully consider maybe what the next step is for you today. Also, you received um, an envelope on the way in. Uh, that's just the way we financially give. You can give online. Um, online, you can see why we give, how the Bible says we give. So if you came ready to do that, uh, we're going to do that in just a moment and drop those in just a moment. But um, I've ran past my time. I need to look at this anyways. Testimony surveys. We talked about this last week if you were here. Um, if you weren't here last week, I want to talk to you about this for a moment. We're doing a book that uh, you won't hear much about for a couple more months after today. Uh, and what it is, it's a testimony book. Testimony, there's power in a testimony. There's power in pointing to Jesus and say, I, I was in this kind of space, but God showed up and brought me through to here. It's beautiful for people to hear not only about what you have to say about God, but to show them that your life has changed because of that God. And so what we're doing is a book of testimonies that we're going to send out to the community. And what this is, is a testimony survey. I want you to look at it. Um, I read that top paragraph. I, I should have had more time for it. Next service, I'll make sure I have more time for it. What this is is just a, a quick snapshot of what God's done in your life. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say like, uh, well, he hasn't really done anything. I, I've lived a pretty good life. I was kind of sheltered and now I, I love Jesus. If you love Jesus, God did something phenomenal in your life, miraculous even, something that you couldn't do on your own. In fact, no one could have done for you, only he could do. It's a miracle and it's a testimony of him saving you from near instead of far. The fact that he kept you from that and saved you in that is beautiful and somebody needs to hear that. And so what we're doing is we're gathering all the testimonies of people that would be willing to share. We won't use your names um, or the names of other people if your story is used. We're going to use about 10 of those that can narrow down to 7 of those. Um, and we're going to have, there'll be an author that calls you. You don't write it yourself. They call you and draw out of you the testimony of God's goodness. Jesus is the, is the star. He, he's the main character in the story of your testimony. You're not. He is. And so maybe you've gone through some of these things, um, and I don't have time, I'm going to read them anyways, because I'm going to. But maybe you've gone through some of these things, deliverance from alcohol, that Jesus delivered you, deliverance from drugs, that Jesus showed up when you're in that and delivered you, deliverance from gangs, maybe you're in some sort of uh, situation like that where, where God showed up in that and pulled you out of that, and you can see his hand at work in it and through it. Forgiveness from abortion, maybe um, you were a, a part of, of, of abortion, and, and it affected you deeply, and, and there's emotions and things tied to that um, and God is amazing has forgiven you from that and shown you what that forgiveness looks like through Christ on the cross taking all of your sins and giving you all of his righteousness and in that you've been forgiven and, and been able to accept that somebody needs to hear that somebody that that feels far from God that has gone through that that is, has made that choice um, and is working through the shame and the guilt often associated with that choice needs to hear that God loves them where they're at right now and that there is forgiveness for them. Forgiveness from criminal activity. Thank you, God. Forgiveness of great sin. Great sin. I guess you get to define what that is. Healing of the body. I've, I've, had, I've experienced that, I've seen that, I've witnessed that, I've been a part of that. Seeing God work in someone's body where the doctors were saying no and God stepped in and did something amazing that only he could get the credit for. Healing from the loss of a child. God showed up in that hurt and that pain and brought healing and restoration. Healing within a marriage, there was a split, there was a brokenness. And when God showed up, things shifted. Healing from physical abuse. Thank you, God. Healing from sexual abuse. I know based on statistics, there's many people in this room that have been abused sexually. Um, and maybe you're not ready to tell that story. But for maybe some of you in the room that have gone through that and there's been healing that happened in that, God did a work to, to heal those, those wounds and that brokenness, maybe identity issues that came with that or whatever that is. Um, and, and you're ready to share that story. There are so many people out there that, that's, that have been in that, that are in that place that need to hear that, that God is the answer. Murder. I've been affected by that in a way that only God came through in to help you. Other. Every believer has a good story right yours below. Recovery from divorce. 
God showed up. Recovery from near-death experience. Sustention. So God sustained you through a birth defect. Maybe for yourself, maybe for your child, but you didn't think you could make it through and God showed up. Sustained you through imprisonment. Sustained you through trial. Sustained you through an unplanned pregnancy. Maybe he sustained you and you survived and found strength from war, military service. Maybe it's not things named on there. Um, I don't know what it is, but there is power and a testimony. And we're going to use these books and get them out into the community. And um, what they do is for the first couple uh, handful of pages for each one of the stories that are shared in these books, it doesn't talk about Jesus. It just talks about brokenness because all of us can relate to brokenness. This world is broken. This world is flawed. The people in this world are broken and flawed. And so there's pain that comes with that. And so it tells the story of that brokenness. And then the, the superstar of the story shows up. God shows up in the story and you see things change from darkness to light and it's beautiful and it brings hope and life and and the way um, to restoration and healing and redemption in Jesus. And we get it out into the community because there's power in your testimony. Oftentimes we disqualify that. Sometimes we're not ready to share that. I pray that you would prayerfully consider if maybe you are ready to share that. If not, I don't want to pressure you. But if the Holy Spirit has put it on your heart to share it, I pray that you would work through the issues of of feelings or emotions um, of what that looks like. If we don't use your testimony, it's not because your testimony isn't phenomenal. It is because we're trying to get a diverse grouping of testimonies, ones that we think will be most um, impactful in this current culture right now. And so we're, we're trying to work through some of those. But can I just tell you another thing? I read through every one of them, and it helps me as a pastor know how to pray and how to praise It shows me what God is doing amongst the people. It helps me get to know you better because I don't quite have enough time to sit down for coffee every week with everybody. But when I read through some of these, I just get to see like God's amazing testimony of God's goodness in people's lives. Um, And it blesses me massively. So I've um, I've outworn my time right now. And so what what we're going to do is I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and we're going to worship. If you would, are we passing buckets or are we going to the corners? Corners? Perfect. So there's going to be ushers at each door on your way out today. If you could take all three of those things, whether you fill them out or not, I pray that you fill them out. Um, and if you could, this is the last week we're doing the testimony survey, so if you were thinking about doing it, today's the day. Um, drop them off with, with the ushers or in the box that's right outside the door after we worship. I'm going to pray and then we're going to worship. God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Mark where we see Jesus Christ on the earth in his earthly ministry show the power and authority that only the God-man Jesus Christ could show, that he is our savior, that he is gracious. And God, help us to see the fact that we need him. And as we turn to him, he's a good, loving God that's in Jesus so that we could have a relationship and righteousness and holiness and purity and removing of shame and guilt and those kinds of things. God, I thank you for the goodness that you came to bring life and life more abundant, Jesus. Help us to walk in that, understand that. God, I thank you right now for the testimonies that you have already done inside of this church body. God, I thank you for for just courage to be able to share some of those stories. God, I also thank you for the testimonies that are happening right now the stories that you're writing right now in people's lives, Lord God. Maybe people came here today and they're broken and they're crying out to you. God, help us to just put our faith with theirs in a prayer of agreement for a testimony of your goodness. God, I pray that that if their marriage is in uh, struggles and in troubles, Lord God, that they would turn to you, the one that can fix and and change everything, Lord God. God, if bodies are, are broken here, God, we pray that we would see a piece of heaven now on earth. We know that we get new bodies forever in heaven. God, we pray for a healing work now on earth. God, for brokenness of hearts, we pray for healing. God, I also pray that if we came here proud today, that you would shake that from us. God, show us places in our life where we might be self-righteous, where we might look down our nose at someone else. God, help us to remember it's only by grace that we have been saved through faith, not by any of our works so that we can boast. God, be glorified in this place as we worship you on our way out. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together.